Hi, welcome to SRD. My name is Scott. Today we're going to talk to Mark Now, a video game designer who's taken a lot of those talents and brought them down to the tabletop. So we've started our introductions and stuff from the last time, but uh, go ahead, Mark, and tell us a little bit about yourself and introduce yourself. Okay, sure. Uh, I'm Mark now. I am a game designer um, for many, many years now. I've been a tabletop gamer for a really long time. Uh, professionally, I make games in the video game industry, and I've done design and programming and just kind of organizing all that stuff. And then I've also just sort of, as a hobby, made a whole bunch of board games and tabletop role-playing games. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so we actually uh, met Mark uh, a few years ago. Uh, he's involved with IO Kane Productions. Um, himself and some other gentlemen that will eventually get on the show if we can ever nail down schedules. Uh, but uh, we met them, and they create LARPs. And the first game that we played with them was the Battlestar Galactica LARP, uh, and then eventually Game of Thrones. And we were absolutely encapsulated uh, by their ability to create systems within the system. And I believe that it was, it was Mark whose uh, game design and ability to uh, put that together is really what, uh, what made it so, I think, special. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about when it comes you. to your, your, your game design, the, creating the, the crunchy stuff, how, how yeah. do you do that? Wow, yeah, all right, so, <laughs> and, and by the way, I, like obligatory sort of like whenever you're working with a team, you know, obviously it's, it's everybody in the team working together. So yeah, I'm primar primarily systems design, but, you know, I think especially if you, if you have a good, healthy, you know, working relationship with other people, you're always crossing over and commenting on stuff. So that said, yes, I was primarily the systems designer. Um, how do you make systems for whatever game you're making? And that's that's a difficult one, right? Because it's like in my the, the easy answer is well, I've done it a bunch, and you just do things, and and you try it out, and you see what happens. And that's not far from the entire truth, by the way. Is that kind of a lot of it is iterating and failing and testing stuff. Um, so you know, you try something, and if it works, then you can modify it a little bit and use it somewhere else. Um, I guess two of the tools that I kind of, and, and they're complementary tools, two of the tools that I use is one thing I call designing away and the other I call designing toward. And okay. let me talk about those a little bit, all right? Sure. So designing toward is I've got some idea for something that I want to happen in the game. So like, let's take the Game of Thrones. Um, we want people vying for political power and we probably want that represented in some tangible way on like a map so people can see it. And maybe you're moving armies around, maybe you possess things. Like I'm already kind of coming up with some ideas to how to serve this greater goal, which is we want a strategic struggle to happen as part of the game. And we want it to be tangible that people can see and can relate to and understand right there in front of them, right? And with that goal in mind, I'm now designing toward that goal, right? Like my okay. mind, because I've seen a bunch of other games, because I've done some design, and just as a player, I know things about how games work. And so, you know, you immediately start thinking about some stuff like, oh, okay, well, armies, if so, how do they control the armies? Is there a map? Uh, is there some, is it a card-based thing? Like there's all kinds of, of ideas now that I can get that are all kind of arrows pointing towards what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, and... As it, there's like a side conversation we can have there, which which I call simulation by default. Uh, we'll kind of put a we're going to put that over to the side for right now. We'll get back to it <laughs> okay. because I want to talk about designing a way. What designing a way is, is it's more of a creative rather than a directed thing. So thinking about maybe even nothing or an entirely other game and you go, hey, you know, it was kind of an interesting mechanic. Is that mechanic where you have a bunch of cards and you can pass them hidden to other people? Like you pass three cards and they pass you three cards and you're trying to make matches and sometimes you have like disasters or stuff. That was an interesting mechanic. Now, maybe I played that in some completely different game, right? But the idea is that with that mechanic, you can start riffing off of that in your mind about how do I modify that mechanic for maybe it can serve other purposes. Like I don't have a place that I'm necessarily going right now with this mechanic. It was just, it was kind of interesting. And what are ways that I can modify that and do things? So it's kind of neat to be able to, in your mind, to be able to flip back and forth between these two things where it's like, hey, I want, you know, I want a Game of Thrones things where people are doing political stuff. And now here's some ideas about just kind of mechanics that are interesting for players to do. It, it, here's a decent example of that sort of thing. 
um, one of the design away mechanics that definitely came into the game was this notion of, you know, what's neat is being able to reach into people's brains and pull their secrets out of them. Right. Too many LARPs, people keep their secrets in here and good players know when to share that. Like good players know when to make drama and story for themselves by making life difficult for themselves. But why not have a mechanic that does that, 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 you know, and we had played a different game that did that where it was like a secret breaker card. And like, that's a really interesting idea. How do we take that idea and designing away from it, thinking of different ways that that could be incorporated into a game and sort of you, you get this web where you have things, you know, are pointing towards your grand goal, but individually are also interesting. And I find that by flipping back and forth between those in my mind, it gets the creativity and everything going and yet towards an entire whole that will be directed towards what you really want. So how much of that came from your, your work in, in video games? on the video game side of it. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's always hard to say, like as a designer, when people want to be designers, when I'm interviewing designers, it's always hard to say what the skill set is. Um, if I had to distill it down, it's kind of this awareness of just design in general. Uh, it's this awareness that you're making things for people to interact with and being aware of the way that people interact with things. And that sounds super simple, but there's a particular book called The Design of Everyday Things that was made by a guy, uh, I forget his name, but if you look up the title, The Design of Everyday Things, design in general, and it's a neat viewpoint kind of into the right way to, in my opinion, to think about things as a designer, uh, which is, uh, and, and let me go back to um, simulation by default, because there's a lot of sort of default behaviors you can do when you're designing things, which is, hey, I'm going to copy the successful game over here, which isn't bad, but it, you're copying it. Ideally, you want to be copying it for a reason because of some function that it has for you that it's serving for the thing you want to make. Um, the other kind of habit that I've seen is what I call simulation by default, which is. I'm making a game and what's my purpose to stuff? OK, you know, I'm making some sort of game. What do people really actually do here? And that's that's not a bad, like, creative thing to do, like, to try to do. Like, I'm making a role-playing game. What was it really like in the medieval ages? I should have a disease table that you could roll on. Um, I should have, you know, an economic thing in this web of – and that – to make that design, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem comes when you're doing that just knee-jerk reaction. Like, a lot of times people will think – I want a mechanism that simulates reality. And again, sometimes that's what you want, but there are a lot of games that that's not what you want at all. And the, the, in the, in the brain of, the, of a designer, what you want to get in the habit of is asking yourself, why am I including that in there? And if the answer is because I want to simulate reality, cool. The answer is I couldn't think of anything. And so I started making charts and tables for stuff. Stop right. <laughs> and go back to, the whole design away, design towards, um, you know, exercises so that you can get your brain thinking about what is it that I'm really actually trying to make here. So I think that sort of thinking I did in video games, that sort of thinking I do in everything I make nowadays. So, so what skills are transferred from your video games to creating tabletops? Right. Uh, so definitely one of the things I got involved with in video games was learning how to apply numbers to systems because a computer doesn't have a sense of judgment, right? Computer, it can't just sort of go, well, that sounds like a difficult task. That's not the way that video games are going to work ever, ever, ever. Human mind works that way. But a video game, it's got to be numbers driving all of these things that are going along, right? So um, I think that more than anything kind of shapes a lot of the ways that I do things. And, and I like breaking out of that box. I like systems that do rely on, on more human and more squishy things, uh, things like diplomacy, social interaction, um, judgment, creativity, um, stuff that can't be quantized. But a lot of times at the end of the day, many games rely on there being a sensible system of numbers that govern it. And even if it's something as simple as, you know, one of my favorite game systems is uh, powered by the Apocalypse, Apocalypse World System. And they've got a very simple system, which is you roll two dice. And less than a seven, something terrible slash really interesting happens to you. And it's in the middle. It's a trade off. And 10 plus, you get what you wanted. And they put different spins on that and different guidances. But that's that's basically the system you could just play a whole game that way now you can add different bonus numbers to those dice 
And it, it's a really simple thing, but two to two die six and with those ranges makes you better than you would be otherwise, but there's still the possibility of failing. Adding five or seven to that die number would be stupid, right? And so you've broken your system because your numbers don't work well. Um, the designer of the game never did that because he realized, hey, that would break the game. And so just the simple act of picking those numbers properly so that the percentages were about right, so there was always interesting opportunities for success and failure, it's a very simple system. You can see it, you know, it's obvious in that sense. But when you start getting more complicated systems, it's like, well, I've got this big LARP and people are trading goods around. What happens if they run out of horses? What happens if they run out of gold? Uh, is one person going to hoard all this stuff and keep the everybody else from playing the game? Um, there's all these interlocking systems and you have to be able to get in there and numerically figure out, look, okay, people are going to be doing this. I know I can't control the people, but at least the numbers make sense. Right. Uh, there's definitely a video I want to do in the future. Uh, it's talking about LARP design, at least a little bit that, that we have because um, I don't think it's something that's really explored by normal tabletop gamers enough. I, I think people think of LARP as the, the boffer weapons and, and beating each other up for the that, most part. When I first heard LARP, that's what I thought of. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I've used it a ton in the tabletop. Um, there are a lot of times that I will actually like to pull my players away from the table to, and, and almost in that LARP setting, uh, the less dice that I can use uh, is better to me, at least for the role play. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't need right. dice for role play. You need people for role play. And that's creating I think that. that's super cool. Yeah, it, it, it's creating that role play. Uh, dice is fine for combat. Uh, that's cool. You know, that's, that's part of the game and that's how you do stuff. But um, I think getting mainstream folks to understand that, that the role play is LARP and LARP is role play and using yep. that can be a great way. I used to pull my players away from the table, go sit outside, um, you know, flipping burgers. And hey, guys, let's... I'm, I'm the bard now. Let's let's have this conversation. Let's just stay in character. Oh, <laughs> let's stay in character. Uh, we have a so giant. I'm, Go ahead. I'm a big, big believer in kind of broad, wide definitions for things. You know, in video games, there's always kind of this faction that wants to say, "Oh, that's not a game." And in my mind, there's no point in that sort of thinking. Like, like I want really broad categories because, again, you can apply things in a bunch of different places. So, um, there was an old board game called How to Host a Murder. And it was just a sort of thing where it's like, yeah, it was, it was, and it was, it was aimed for the normies, right? It was stuff, you, it was something you could buy in Target even. And it was like, hey, you know, you're going to do like a little dinner murder mystery. And it's all canned. Like role players would find it very constraining. But when it comes down to it at the end of the day, that game is a LARP. Mm -hmm. That's a LARP, right? And so the idea that these type that these labels have to stay in very little narrow boxes, I think is, is terrible. Like we should be opening these things up and thinking about different ways they can apply and different ways we can get other people to come on in and enjoy what's cool about them. If you think of LARPs only as boffer stuff, and that's fun, like I've done that, it I love that fun. too. <laughs> um, but if, if somebody doesn't relate to that aspect of it, mm -hmm. then the, the wrong idea to come away from that is I hate LARPs. It's like, no, 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 there's, there's a lot of other things in this space we can explore, even to the simple as what you said, which is just look, we're just going to be the we're going to be doing the role playing game, the RP part of LARP, and but we're going to be doing it live instead of sitting at the table. We're going to be our characters. So we're now a live action role playing game. Like that's yeah, that's it. Done it. That's, that's it. That's the step that it takes. What's well, the thing? And, and, now and there's getting, a bunch of interesting stuff. Yeah, getting people to realize that if you have a job, if you have a career, you've LARPed. Um, there isn't a single <laughs> training that I've ever been yeah. to where they yep. didn't hand you a sheet of paper that was like, all right, now you're yeah. Phil who's uh, depressed or has a, uh, some sort of problem and you're the other person who is supposed to you know, deal with that problem, solve that problem, that's LARPing. We don't say that obviously in the, in the business, the, the normie world as, as, you, as you said, right. but that's what it is, I mean, it's LARPing. Um, we've all done it um, and, and getting people to get that away from, uh, away from you talk about the, the boffer weapons. Um, what's that movie? Uh, Role Models, great movie, love that movie. It did yep. not do us well. Uh, no, that's, that's, right. yeah, yeah. that's all yeah. people think about is, is beating people up. Along those lines, by the way, the, in the local LARP scene, there's a guy who's he's a colonel in the reserves. And every once in a while, he has to go out and do, you know, training yep. stuff. And he goes, well, I'm, I'm I'm off LARPing with my other friends this weekend. Sorry, guys. Yeah. You know, and it's 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 military exercises that he's referring to. But uh -huh. 
it's a LARP. And, Absolutely. And doing a lot of that stuff is actually, he runs LARPs and stuff. And he says there's tons of skilled crossover there in every, in every way. There is. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a guardsman and my specific duty is working with uh, fatality search and recovery uh, during natural and, and chemical disasters. And a lot of those exercises, they hire people, pretty good money actually, like $14 as role players to come in and pretend to be dead, to be sick, uh, to have specific symptoms so that our medical team can work with them and be like, well, hey, what's, what's bothering you? And if uh, the particular is like say cyanide, whatever the effects would be of cyanide, mm -hmm. they would say, oh, well, you know, my, my eyes are bleeding and, or whatever. And they work with that and then we handle our part. And that's all exercises are, is just a LARP that somebody on top said, you know, here's the scenario yep. and here's your pieces and, and let's put them into play. And it, it's just the same thing. It really is the same thing. Yep. And getting back to what I was saying about, you know, the design away idea, um, I've, I've played a whole bunch of different strategy board games and I found some neat mechanics in there. And when we were making Game of Thrones, there was definitely board game influence in that LARP. As you know, mm -hmm. you, you were controlling a lot of the, the characters in there. And one of the answers that I came up with that wound up sticking for the movement for the armies is just a straight rip from diplomacy, the board game which is you guys were submitting orders and then we were doing simultaneous resolution. Like that's, that is an idea that I ripped straight from, you know, old, old school, one of my favorite board games, diplomacy, that as I was thinking about it, there were ways of modifying that. So it really suited well the game of Thrones game we had there. So there was a board game aspect to that LARP. There was no buffer in that LARP. Uh, we had people in gorgeous, gorgeous costumes. Yeah. So everybody felt like they were there, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're doing role playing, but we're dressed up. Nobody's hitting each other with weapons. In fact, there's hardly any interpersonal combat. It's all being done with armies and politics. And there's some people that aren't doing any of that. They're just kind of like, they're doing relationship things and just being a character. Uh, and a lot of times what we were doing is suiting roles to what we knew people wanted to do. So if we knew there was a particular player and she didn't want to have anything to do with any of the mechanics and we, we knew exactly what she wanted, it was like, that's fine. We'll write a character where you can do this part of LARP while everybody else is doing kind of this part of LARP. Okay. And it can be fun to be in that intersection. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really tailoring your your players to, to your characters, whether it's tabletop or LARP, um, which essentially the same thing as we're talking about, is a big deal. You know, trying to find what the, that player is into, their buy-in uh, that we've talked about, you know, is really key. And if they're not into crunchy stuff and you have the ability to not let them do crunchy stuff, then by all means, you know, do what you can to help them. Yeah, I mean, do you find that like on the fly you wind up being of a mini designer while you're playing, you know, tabletop, for example. If, if you're playing sit-down role-playing games, find that you modify the game, modify the systems based on your players, based on what's happening right then and there? Yeah, all the time. Um, especially, and I think we talked about it in our video either this week or another one, either way, um, there are times when I, I really observe what the, the players, what's going on with them, if they're engaged or if they're not. Um, and as you're playing, uh, if they are engaged in the crunchy stuff and they seem to be excited about it, well then we'll just keep on doing that. You know, We'll keep on doing the, the roles and the combat and. The thing that I think a lot of people don't understand is that you are control behind that screen. Um, I think that rolling out in front of everybody is a horrible idea because then you're locked to the rule set. Um, if I can roll behind the screen, then I can extend or decrease that combat as much as I want. If I see somebody is starting to get a little bored, um, well, you just, you know, you swings right. down your ax and you lop off the orc's head and, you know, blood spurts everywhere and, you know, you can, you can do that. But if it's out in the open where everybody can see what's behind the, 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 the I don't know, what is that? The Wizard of Oz, right? The, yeah, the big talking man. head. Yeah. Right. If you see what's behind the big talking head, then it's not as exciting anymore. No, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I agree with certain players. Like it's, it's the same sort of thing where you have to know your players. Some players would love everything to be out in the open because they view it more as a... Um, well, I mean, there's different ways you can tilt mm -hmm. role-playing games, right? So in some cases, you can see it as kind of the arena of honest competition that we're all going to be competing in. And as the DM, my job is to come up with reasonable, objective competition. Your job is to come up with the clever ways of overcoming that. And we're honestly just going to let the system go. 
Right. Um, I don't tend to play that way, but I know people who do, and it's a viable way of having fun. Sure. Again, I think it totally depends upon the group, and everybody's just got to be in sync. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's any right or wrongs in a lot of these. There's just more like tools and techniques that get you to particular places. And the real question is, is that a destination that everybody wants to go to? Right. Yeah, th there are a lot of times when players will ask to do something specific that the rules don't cover. And then you do, you, you come up with some thing in your head to make it work for them. Like, I, I don't know, I want to tie a rope on something and I don't think fifth edition has any rope tying rules, for example, you know, just roll me this and then we'll figure it out. Just something along those lines to, to make that game work. Um, but what you're talking about, and actually it was Bree and I that just did the, the Call of Cthulhu versus D&D yep. uh, talk that we were talking about that. Um, Tomb of Horrors is a big one that I like ah. that is about, yeah. that is the DM versus the player period. Yep. Um, and if yep. I want to play that game, typically I will pull out Descent because I think Descent is probably, that is the quintessential, I'm the DM and I'm going to kill you and I want to kill you because right. it's part of the game and you're the players and you survive. Mm -hmm. Um, and I love that game because it is out in the open beforehand that this is the way the game is meant to be played. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Our role-playing games, I think, have really evolved over the last few years, and it's not like that so much anymore. It's, it's really more of the, the collected storytelling, the everyone put together and having this good time versus the player versus GM thing that we've, right. we used to do. So now two, two thoughts immediately come to head my brain as you're talking about that stuff. One was... Uh, one of the things that we did with our LARPs, and it was in direct response to LARPs that we did love, but that we didn't love a particular aspect of them. And I'm going to describe the aspect now. The aspect is in certain LARPs, what happens is as a player, my job is to come up with crazy creative ideas and then pester the GM so that they will influence the course of events based upon the cool idea that I came up with, right? So if I'm playing in some... LARP based on, say, American gods, uh, the, the Neil Gaiman stories where everybody's like a, a, a god. And if I'm, you know, if I'm the god of media, then I might go to one GM and I might say, hey, can I get the news industry to put out all these different stories indicting this player so that, you know, kind of make him look bad? And the GM might go, yeah, that's a cool idea. I'm going to incorporate that into the story. So the the problem with that sometimes is what it creates is it creates this game system where nobody really knows what the rules are. Yeah. The rules are monopolize a, a GM's time, pitch them your idea, and then cool things will happen. Yep. So what we did instead is we basically took all that stuff and put it out there objectively and said, no, look, the way you guys affect the universe is you have to talk to other players and you have to submit moves on the board. Talking to us does you no good at all because all we're going to do is we're going to tell you go to the room and find that out or I'm going to explain to you the mechanics that you have to do the thing you want to do. And so we ran a very, very like, you know, in terms of Game Master Fiat and the Game Master being the one kind of in charge of tilting things to make it more interesting. We completely stepped away from that responsibility and said, no, nope, we're running a game where it's all about you players and it's all about the rules as written. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, we felt the same way uh, when we, we put together our LARPs. You know, it really is. It's almost, it, well, it's way different, honestly, because with uh, tabletop games, you were there. It's an interaction. It's a constant interaction. With a LARP, you're, you're writing your characters, um, which is the meat of your game. And then you're putting in whatever mechanics that you have. And then you present it to them and say, here, <laughs> go do me. your best. Mm -hmm. Like, yep. because even though we expect it to go one of two or three ways, um, people do weird things like start Hawaiian pineapple clubs and, you know, <laughs> and right. yeah. they just do their own things. And it's, that's awesome. That's the best part about LARPs is creating that thing and giving it to them because the GM shouldn't really interact at all other than, you know, whether it's resolving a particular mechanic perhaps or combat, um, if it, that is involved in some of your LARP, um, or just saying yes or no, like you, like you said, with specific yep. mechanics, it's not about, Hey, can I do this? Um, and we've accidentally ran... Uh, other people's LARPs down by doing that, that exact thing. Um, we were given characters that weren't necessarily well fleshed out. Um, and so by asking uh, the GM and the GM giving a lot of fiat with it, we inadvertently took over a game. Um, it got a lot more fun, but I kind of felt bad, you know? <laughs> right. So now, is, were you taking it over in a way, and this is always kind of a key for me, is 
were you taking it over in a way where you could create fun for other players as well? Because a lot of times if you go into a LARP with the idea that, you know, fun is this scarce resource, I'm going to hoard it all up, mm -hmm. that can go really flat. Whereas if you think of it in terms of I am going to see how many other people I can either be, make them the hero or be an interesting villain for or give them interesting information or give them an interesting side quest or conundrum to deal with or just even pose them with kind of a dilemma that their character is not sure what to do about If, As a player, if I go in and those are the things I'm trying to do, uh, I find that you create even more fun for everybody. You know, it, it like it grows. Yeah. In, in that particular situation, it was a, um, you talked about it earlier, how a lot of players have secrets and they don't keep, and they, they keep those secrets. And we've talked about this offline about one of our older games um, about, you know, you don't want to write people keeping their secrets. Um, you want them to get their secrets out there. And that was something we took and moved forward with. Um, this particular group had not received that message yet either. And so everyone had secrets, not just one or two people, but everyone had secrets that, that weren't getting out there. And so uh, Brianna and I created a network of secrets. Uh, <laughs> and we, we, we bought and sold them within the game. And it wasn't written in, but it got a lot of people more involved in the game. Cool. Uh, nice. Because it's, it's like tabletop. You know, when you see someone just sitting there and they're not interested, uh, to me, LARP is 10 times worse because they'll be sitting in a chair over there by themselves. Yeah. And that's, that's worse. Like, at least in a D&D game, they can pick up a book and at least, you know, like, maybe look at what their next level will be like. Mm -hmm. uh, but LARPs, I think it's really obvious. Uh, and so, yeah. you know, we really we change that around. Um, but it is, it's, it's weird. It, yeah, I'm, I'm done with that. <laughs> so it's, it's, it, uh, it's interesting, you just triggered a memory of, I did a similar thing in your Pearl Harbor game. Uh, which is I, I'm I'm basically one of the bad guys in that game. You you guys cast me as one of the dudes that was you know kind of trying to do evil stuff. Uh, I was I was trying to dig up the the uh, I was trying to go ahead and, and roll with the Cthulhu um, artifacts and basically bring ruin on everything. Uh, and so at some point I had started to go a little crazy as you do, and my character I mean and. Um, it was a party, and so at some point my character was crazy and drunk and just sort of going around and saying, well, what about you? Are you in on this whole plan to go and uh, raise the elders up? Because if you are, there's a good position for you, young man. And some people were like, yeah, actually, yes, I'm in on that. And other people were like, oh, my gosh, he's evil. Let's kill him. <laughs> um, but in both cases, I was creating opportunities for people to respond to that, right? Um I could have kept that secret in my back pocket the whole game. And that wouldn't have been nearly as interesting as, you know, at some point being crazy recruiter guy who uh, some people were actually not even sure if I was telling the truth because like, <laughs> surely, surely he wouldn't be openly recruiting everybody <laughs> into the, and so it took them a long time He's to actually evil. decide. <laughs> it, took, it took them a while to decide that I really was somebody that needed to be taken care of and not just a crazy old dude. I had a great, I had a great time. Yeah, it's, um, I don't want to side rail everything into, into a LARP conversation, but that's fine. But it, the interesting thing about LARPs is that the players aren't just players, but they're also the game masters. They're their own game masters. And they are, they're just as, I don't want to say responsible, but they are just as, uh, it, it is. It, the weight is just as much on them as it is the other players to have a good time. Like you, yep. you make your own game when and it comes to In a LARP, LARPs. it seems like you, the more you put into it, the yes. more you're going to get yeah. out of it. You know, if you're the yeah, type of person absolutely. that just wants to sit back and you're okay with that, that's fine, but you're going to miss out on a lot of the other aspects of the whole, the whole system and, and the game. Yeah, absolutely. But it, getting your own story out there, getting story from other people, the same thing that you would do if you were a GM at a tabletop. Yeah. Just every player does that. Hopefully. There's a, there's a style of GMing that, um, most most people do, and I, I don't like you know broad things. Which this is this is the secret to great GMing. But <laughs> there is a thing that I particularly enjoy a style of GMing in in, in tabletop role playing games, which is basically this: my job as the GM is to create interesting situations that I don't know how you're going to respond to. Mm -hmm. So here's a thing that happened, and now as the player. What are you going to do about that? And it's, it's no good if I set it up as just a, like it's an obvious railroad. Like, you know, the woman comes in and she's crying and she says, I need heroes. And it, let's, you know, like, are, do you help or not? It's like most players go, OK, I get what you're trying to do. Yes, we help. Um, whereas if it's 
if, if it's a slightly different situation, it's like, no, no, look, this is a dilemma of some kind, or this is an opportunity for you to express who your character is and what they stand for, or what are you willing to sacrifice in order to accomplish what? Those are the really super interesting questions, right? And so bringing that then either to tabletop or to LARP, as a player, you can actually do things like that as well. Uh, one of my favorite characters I ever played was in Apocalypse World. It's a it's a post apocalyptic, you know, crazy, almost uh, almost like Mad Max sort of setting. And my character ran this cult, and what he wanted more than anything is for people just to prove that they could stand up for something, even if it was something that the character himself didn't approve of. He was like, "Well, I I don't agree with that at all, but good on you for doing it, right?" Um, and the neat thing about that character was that he presented a bunch of weird conundrums for people who were interacting with him because he would constantly be like, well, you say you want this, I'm willing to help, but you've got to give up that other thing. And people go, well, wait a minute. He's, I mean, he's willing to help, but that seems like a high price. What do I do about this guy? Do I go along with him? Do I, do I fight him? Do I walk away? Um, and there's lots of opportunities now to do whatever it is you really want, um, which I think is that's some of the coolest moments in all of storytelling is when we see a character faced with what do you really stand for? Which way do you really want to go? And it's not just a obvious railroad one dimensional path. I, I really enjoy the, uh, and we're just talking about railroads, but the, the, the moral dilemma and it's uh, there's that old uh, graphic of the, do you save the, the child on the railroad, uh, sw switch the tracks and then the train goes into the town and blows everyone up or do you sacrifice <clears throat> the child? Uh, so is that, that moral dilemma, I know that's an extreme, but it's, it's, a, it's a psychological effect. And those are the kind of decisions I like to put forth for more players. Yep. You know, yeah. do, you, you, do you stop the bandits who are really just trying to raise money to feed their own family and children and that will come back up later on in the game? Or do you let them continue to harass the people on the road? And those are the things that I like to, I love to have those choices in games. And that way they put forth they feel more alive to me in that way. It's not just bandits on the road that, you know, hey, they're robbing people, you kill them, that's it, you never hear from it again. Yeah. It's, you know, hey, you killed them, and this family, now you find the next time you come into town, they're out there begging on the road. I'm like, well, what happened to you? Oh, well, my daddy got killed by these random people on a road, right. and, you know, <laughs> yeah. now I need food and bread, and my mom, she's sick from polio, and, you know, all these other things, and you're really putting the weight of their decisions on players. Um, and it makes them stop and think, and, and it really deters the motor, uh, murder hobo um, aspect that a lot of people get into. We just murder right. everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what games are you playing right now, Mark? Uh, let's see. Right now I'm in a uh, – the one campaign I'm playing on a regular basis with my group is a game called Masks, which is – it's a superhero game. But, uh, you know, as, as you might have been able to tell, it's not a game that's just about going out and beating up bad guys because that's my style of game is is different than that. Um, this game is about juvenile superheroes and them coming of age and growing into themselves and deciding who they are and what they stand for. And so in, in this game, we've had a lot of it, it's set up. It's set up so that you can, you know, take it in a bunch of different directions. Um, but the key thing that's been happening is who's the leader of this group? Uh, how much are we willing to take risks? How much do we stand for fighting evil versus, you know, protecting people? Because sometimes those two things can conflict. Sometimes staying closer to home and doing kind of the more mundane things is the thing you need to do rather than going out and chasing the glory and going after the easy win. Uh, and so it's been really interesting that game watching what could normally be a genre that could be mostly about, you know, what do my powers do? And we're rolling dice, we're calculating. And again, nothing wrong with that sort of game, just not my cup of tea. Um, and having this game that's more about the interpersonal personalities and what they stand for. So Masks, super cool. And then um, the other thing that I've been playing lately is a game that I designed with Tara Kerioleason. Uh, the game is called um, The Good, The Bad, The Undead. And it is set in a weird West setting. And again, the game centers around, you know, what do you stand for and what do you do? When do you draw the gun and when do you not? Um, do, are you going to interfere in the affairs of people? And if so, are you going to take on the responsibilities that come from that? Right. Uh, and But all wrapped up in the cool Wild West and weird supernatural stuff happening 
you know, uh, atmosphere. And so, you know, you still get cool fights. There's still moments where the gunfighter is stepping out in the middle of the street and there's, you know, a whole gang there and can, can she face them down or not? Um, but it's also about, you know, why did she put herself in that position to begin with? And what is it that she's doing that for? And, and in the case of my game, are you really willing to get gunned down? Because that happens. That, that definitely, ha you can't, it's not a, it's not a fake, you know, Oh, of course, I'm going to go be the hero. It's like, well, you know, you might get gunned down. Yeah. And I've had that happen to one of the characters. And he was like, you know, I, this is what I went out and stood for. And I'm totally cool with that because I made that choice. Nice. It sounds really fun. Is that something that's going to come out like for other people to play? So, or? Maybe uh, like I, I can make it available. Like, what I do a lot of times is I get talking with one of my friends or there's some competition or something. And I've got an idea or we've got collectively an idea that we want to work on and we work on it. We make a game and then it's a game that we just kind of play for a while and I'll bring it to local conventions sometimes and run it for other people. And then, you know, that's it. And we move on to something else. It becomes a game that I sometimes pull out and play, but I don't ever go and like, you know, fully publish these things most of the time. So, um, Someday Mark can just, have a book of just random games yeah, that he built over the years. Maybe, maybe like this big ass book. book. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so most of the time I'm driven by something that I want to play with my friends and that's the motivation. And so selfishly, I kind of get that far and then stop. Awesome. I know with, you know, like with Matt Mercer and, and then the new critical role class subclasses that he's creating with that and releasing. I know, you know, you talked about creating stuff like that and never putting it out. I think people are wanting more of that kind of stuff, more of that custom home brewed. How, how do you have, or what advice do you have for crafting unique like mechanics into your game systems or? Oh, wow. Um, so uh, it, like definitely I'm, I'm a big fan of stealing things from other people. Um, Amen. If, if you play the game and you know why the core engine works, um, then that's a neat place to start and be able to figure out what else you're doing. Good, bad, and the undead is a hack from Apocalypse World. So at the core, it uses that same stuff. Now, there's some differences there in what I wanted to evoke in terms of the themes and the atmosphere. So, you know, you want weird supernatural things. And so I put in some mechanics about what happens when, and a different flavor of that is still an apocalypse world. So it's not like I'm, I'm in, innovating tremendously here, but there were changes that needed to be made to kind of fit what was going on. And having played apocalypse world and knowing kind of how it tends to shape the player experience and how I wanted this experience to be different, I was then able to make the changes I wanted to make to fit that. So I guess, you know, again, going back to some combination of designing towards and designing away where, I had a theme and, and, and the co-designer Tara uh, came up with a lot of interesting ideas in terms of what would be populating in this world and how it would feel. And then together coming up with the systems that would help, you know, again, grabbing different things from different games that we thought worked well and figuring out how to shape that towards the end goal that we were looking for. So, um, yeah, I guess number one bit of advice is feel free to steal. Number two is, when you're making changes to it, make it with a purpose. And it, it can be, you know, it can be, again, riffing on what, what might work or this is directed towards a particular intent. And then third is, which is really super important, I think, is design is iteration. It just is. Um, the first thing you make is always going to be garbage in some way. <laughs> and so being willing to, after a game session, sit down and go, this worked nothing the way I thought it did, or even in the on the fly, in the moment. There was entire systems where I put up my hands in the middle of a game and I said, everybody, I'm sorry. Um, this particular thing we're doing right here is not working very well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hand wave some of this, and, and it, it, particularly with some of the people I play with, and after the session, let's talk about what I might replace that with in the future. Sure. And so being willing to kind of put some play testing and honest play testing where you're willing to change things and not being defensive about excusing why it's still good. Yeah. Um, and what you're talking about yeah. is just being honest with yourself. Uh, and that's yeah. not always necessarily with, uh, you know, designing something, but in just running games in general, sometimes you're going to put forth an idea during a, a tabletop session that just doesn't go well. And it, it's, it's better to just be like, all right, it's not working. You know, like you said, right. um, why don't you guys take a break? I'm going to take 10, 15 minutes, go get some pizza, and we'll come back to it. And, you know, I'll 
I'll give you something fresh, you know? Right. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Just be honest with yourself. Uh, really read your players, knowing what they are, what, what, what they want as best you can. You know, being able to read people, I think is a huge skill that I think a lot of us could learn. So do you have any, do you have any like formal ways that you kind of uh, iterate and debug the DMing process? Because, you know, when you're DMing, you're designing an experience. It's, it's design. You're designing experience for your players. Um, and they're helping you do that. But so in that sense, you know, being a good DM relies on iteration. It relies on being able to do a thing, analyzing it and doing it differently the next time. Um, so do you have, do you have any ways that you'd like, is it all kind of by the seat of your pants and by your gut? Or do you have any like systems, that you know, you rely on to help your next DM system be better than the one you just ran? Yeah. So, um, a lot of what I do is on the fly um, and has to do with reactions of the, the individuals in front of me. I, I do travel a lot and so I do do a lot of store games um, and so I meet a lot of new people. But reading people is, is pretty much universal. There are those few outsiders that you know they are kind of hard to read but if someone is bored, it's not necessarily hard to, to tell if they're bored or if they're mad at what you did. Um, but in between sessions, specifically at home, um, I, I am a big fan of the AAR, the After Action Report. Um, we actually talk about that, I think, on our Monday episode, yep. right? Yep. Um, that's all about feedback. And, and that is something that I do apply, not as formal as what we discuss in, in the video, but along those lines. You know, what went well, what didn't go well, um, what happened, how, what changes could I could have made to make those better. So uh, I think the example we use there is um, the, the players were supposed to find um, a quest in the, the bar. The bar. Yeah, supposed to find a quest in the bar. Uh, we're they're supposed to kill rats in the cellar. This is just the example we use in the video. Um, instead, they ended up having a concert outside in the town yeah. The square. Yeah, they, they, they have a dance party outside, right? Because it's funny. Um, and the reason they did that is because of that I mentioned that it sound the bar that was outside sounded like Van Halen. So while that was fun and it drew their attention to that that hook, it pulled them away from the actual hook that I wanted them to go to. And this happens all the time, especially for DMs that, that like to do, use improv. Um, you have ideas that constantly come to you and you are like, well, well, this would be cool, but then you end up drawing away from what you did prepare for, that little bit that you did do, because I like to outline and then play, play with my outline. And how they get there isn't really important as long as they get there. Um, and so what I've done is I've, I've ripped them away from that hook. And how I could have fixed that is, well, maybe the bartender could have ran outside and say, you know, hey, come help me. Um, you know, there's a giant rat, you know, what, yeah. rodents of in ridiculous size or yeah, something like what is that, that Princess, but... Princess Bride? Rodents of... Uh... Of unusual size. Yes, rodents of unusual size, thank you. <laughs> inside of the, inside, come help us out. And so those things that I, I typically do, especially in between my sessions when I'm running campaigns, because I do, uh, I typically have a new player at least every game that I run. Um, there's always some new person that we've met that's like, oh, hey, I want to try D&D. &D. Yeah. And so we rotate people out or people get busy with their lives. Um, and so I, I know what they like. like. Like I know what, you know, my typical players like, what they do. But there's always that new person that I'm trying to, especially if they're brand new to the hobby, that, you know, I want them, I want them to like the hobby. You know, I want them to be a part of it with us. And, and so really digging into what they did and didn't like. If I can get the feedback from them, that's great. If not, I rely on that self. On that right. Self. Yeah. Yeah. Another yeah, thing we um, also do is, you know, at the end of every session, everybody's always got a cool down period, you know, where they're, everybody's gathering up their materials or, you know, sitting around having a few drinks. And we use that time to discuss how the session went there, you know, how, what you like about the session, what you didn't like, you yeah. know, that type of stuff. It can definitely be hard to get honest feedback from people. <laughs> um, I know in a professional setting, when designers are talking to other designers, we're used to a certain amount of candor with each other mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't generally fly in the general public where you can straight up come to somebody and go, look, this this design that we're using, this thing is utter garbage. It's not doing the thing that we want it to do at all. We're going to have to redesign it from the, from the ground up. Right. And that's kind of the way that designers talk to each other very often. Um, that could get into a heated di dis dispute about it, but... Um, that's not that's not socially unacceptable among professional designers to, to give very blunt feedback like that, especially if it's if it comes along with, uh, you know, ideas or analysis that can bring that forward into a productive resolution. It's yeah, not don't just, just point out the problem, give me a solution it. to help fix the exactly. problem. Exactly. 
Exactly. Usually, and if it's accompanied with some analysis as well, as far as why you think that is, a lot of times it's, you know, it's not necessarily in dispute that it is not working well, but it can be in dispute why. Um, but then going out and dealing with the general public, you run a session for people, it seems like it was a little flat. You talk to them, they're like, oh, this was great. Oh, this, yeah. And and not only that, but they they want to come back and do it again. And it's like, wow, are my perceptions way, way off? Or yeah. are they being polite? Uh, it's it's hard it's hard to make sense out of it sometimes. Sure. Uh, when you when you ask for feedback, and that's the worst for me because I, I know if something fell flat, like I know that if I were in that situation after the fact, there are things that I would have liked to have been better. But then you ask for that feedback. You know, you send out your surveys, you talk to people, and they're like, "Oh no, it was wonderful. It was great." Um, we just had a we just talked to Dan in our last interview, and he talked about his biggest thing when it came to uh, printing and, and putting out material and, and sources and books. Um, the biggest thing that will help you is getting that good feedback from an honest yeah. person, a third person who's not going to lie to you, not going right. to suck up. You know, give you that good like, "No, this is trash. Like, what you're working on, it's just no good." You know, we know that you love it, but it, you need to need to work on it, and that's true for anything. One of the uh, one of the things that that um, I a technique that I've sometimes used that I think helps some. It, it can be a little tricky to use, but if you if you straight up ask somebody, you know, how was that? Was it good? Were there any problems? A lot of times, for politeness sake, they'll say everything was great. Um, whereas if you if like you, sometimes I run a session, I think it was flat. If I have a, a, a suspicion why it might have been flat, then you can ask questions now instead of instead of string straight up. Was that good or was that bad? You could say, hey, in future sessions, would you prefer it if we did it a little bit more X or a little bit more Y? Right. Because if you think, hey, the problem here, I think, was you know, maybe we're in a little bit too grindy combat where we're doing too much tactical calculations and that, that really threw off the pacing of the game. If you want honest feedback on that, you can ask a question like, hey, would you guys prefer more streamlined combats that's, that aren't as realistic or are you enjoying this sort of tactical simulation? And now you've got, now you're not putting somebody on the spot to tell you you suck. They're expressing, you know, an A-B choice between they're helping you decide where to steer the ship, right? Sure. And so not only is it a more productive conversation, but it also will help them to be a little more open about what the way they felt about things. Um, one tool that I like, and I'm not really a huge fan of Facebook anymore, um, yeah. but we do use our, our groups there as far as for our games. Um, it's how we communicate a lot. It's how we do a lot of uh, messages to the DM, the GM, that kind of thing. Um, but a tool that I like to use is they have the survey that's there. Um, and it, it kicks out to everybody and, and just like that, you know, hey, our last game, there was it was super grindy in the combat. Is this something you prefer or not prefer? And people will typically click, you know, the yes or no versus giving you a full answer. Um, right. And even though it does show like their little face next to it, it they'll still at least give you that click. Um, it, d it gives you that notification. It's after the game. It's less confrontational for a lot of folks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it seems to be something that's worked out pretty well over the years. It's one of the few things yeah. of Facebook that still. And like like getting good at anything. Uh, you know, practicing something over and over is useful, but if you practice something in the wrong way, you're just building bad habits. Yeah. And so that, that feedback loop of performance analysis, changing it, and then going back and doing it again, um, that's the thing you really want. So the more tools you have for, you know, honestly trying to assess how well you're doing it. And role playing is such a weird thing because different audiences, different moods, different days, different oh, yeah. systems, something that worked really well yesterday can be completely inappropriate today. And so, and that's part of what I really love about it is it's such a rich, it's such a rich ecosystem to jump in there and figure out and master and play with, with other people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what makes it really awesome. But it also means that it's going to be really, really hard to, uh, to step up your game. One of the things you talk about is trying to get feet, player feedback and, and want to be reluctant about getting that. Um, one of the things we do is at the start of every session, we recap what happened last session. And a lot of times the GM will give out, you know, bonus experience for knowing something or paying attention during the session. You know, like they, they give a full synopsis and they may get, you know, 100 or 200 XP for that. Um, are you a proponent for giving XP or basically, you know, Reward-based incentives for right. that type of huh, stuff. Interesting. Um, I, you know, again, all my answers are like based up on my personal, the what I would feel. Um, different people have different 
styles and flavors, and that's totally fine. In my position as a player, when I'm playing a game that has XP, and a lot of my games don't have that sort of mechanic nowadays, uh, the whole earn it XP and level up and become more powerful is not as core a mechanic in a lot of my games as, say, it is in D&D. But if I'm playing a game where that's the mechanic, I kind of don't want outside weird influences messing with that because I think part of the okay. part of the part of the system for me is um, it's it's all part of like the game as an objective challenge. Like I am trying to perform within the rules. I'm trying to perform well enough to earn my accomplishments and my victories. And so to get it for something that seems outside of the system seems a little cheaty, weird for me. Um, but again, you know, it, it, it all comes down to what the mix of players is and the mood and what you're getting out of it. If, if that is an effective tool for you and your group, you know, <laughs> thumbs up. Um, if, if on the other hand, it's being met with some weird raised eyebrows, then there are some questions you can ask. And that's, that's the same, same as it is with almost everything in role-playing. Right. Sometimes it'll work. And sometimes it won't, and your job is to figure out how to steer that ship. Absolutely. Uh, when anything that you do that's uh, homebrew um, is always, you know, for the table. You know, some folks have been doing things for certain years. Yeah. Uh, I know that uh, we used to to get background stories out of people. We used to offer them feats in, th in third edition Dungeons and Dragons, and it was the only way to get them to get background stories. Like, I need you to give me at least a half a page, like three to five sentences, right. and if you give that to me, I'll give you a feat. Uh, <laughs> it, it worked. Um, it, it was it was awful. It was stupid, but it, it, it did work. But the, you know, a lot of tables wouldn't do that. Um, we used to do a lot of times when I used to teach people uh, different games. I would give them experience or magic items or whatever um, for being able to tell me about certain rules. So especially if I'm teaching someone new, like how do you attack something? And they'll be like, oh well, you know, you roll a d100, and if it's underneath this particular score and this and that, I'm like, oh that's great. You know, here's here's some inspiration or here's you know, something, some sort of incentivization to get the players involved in the system. And not everyone's going to do that. And that's fine. You know, um, different strokes for different folks when it comes to those kinds of things. You would never do that at a convention yeah. or a store game because that is, that's a whole nother beast right. um, of, of information. Um, well, Mark, thank you very much for coming with us again. I think it's the second, third time. Second uh, time. <laughs> Third time's a charm, second time recording. Yeah, we yeah. got there. No, I enjoy it. I like, I like talking about this stuff. I like talking with you guys. So we, we, honestly, if you came back and said we're going to do this all over again, I'd be like, all right, sure. When do when, when you want to talk again? We'll so, do it. So all we got to do is lie to him and tell him we didn't get to do Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm, good. I'm good for six or seven episodes. You just yeah, right. <laughs> well, we will definitely have you back on the show, but it will be a different topic next time and a whole nother recording. Not again. Looking forward to it. Cool. Not the same topic again. <laughs> I want to thank Mark for coming on the show today. If you guys have any questions for him, let us know down in the comments below. And actually, if you come on over to our Discord, he frequents there quite often. So you can, I'm sure you could leave him a question right there. Hit us a like and share us with your friends. And if you like what you see here, go ahead and subscribe to us. We'll see you next week. Bye.